It's a great pleasure to introduce Jeff Cheeger, who will soon be an alumnus of, of our university. Um, um, I, yeah, I'm not going to give Jeff a big introduction. I've already recorded one that he will hear, I think, next week. Um, I'm happy to announce uh, that he is the recipient of the 2021 uh, Shaw Prize, which was just announced. And uh, we're lucky that, uh, to have him here giving the colloquium today. Um, and the, it's too small on my screen to read the title. Uh, so I will just uh, have Jeff explain. OK, so uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure to give this talk. It's particularly a pleasure because one of the first talks I ever gave uh, roughly a half a century ago, I think, I was invited by Dick Lashoff to talk about the splitting theorem. Um, and that was a precursor of what I want to talk about today. Uh, Non-collapsed Gromov-Hausdorff limit spaces with uh, Ricci bounded below. So we want to consider uh, a Gromov-Hausdorff limit space. Uh, I'll recall what that means. So it's some kind of weak geometric limit of a sequence of Riemannian manifolds. And there are two conditions on the sequence. One is the uniform lower bound on Ricci. So Ricci is a symmetric bilinear form on each tangent space. We assume it has a definite lower bound and the minus n minus one that would correspond to same lower bound as in hyperbolic space with curvature minus one. And the second point is the collapsing condition, non-collapsing condition rather, be non-collapsing, a lower bound uniform on the volumes of balls of radius one at our base point. So this is a pointed notion of convergence in general. And so we call that be non-collapsed. And uh, that's an important assumption for controlling uh, what these limit spaces might look like, which is what we're interested in. Uh, so there's some sort of weak limits of geometric, uh, weak geometric limits. The, you can think, uh, we'll give examples in a moment, but you can think that the manifolds, which are smooth, look more and more to the naked eye like this limit space and no microscope of finite resolving power would allow you to distinguish between the manifolds in the sequence and the limit space whose structure we're trying to understand uh, if we got far enough out in the sequence. So I want to discuss some new structural results. It's joint work with our neighbor and Wen Shui Zhang. Uh, and just appeared uh, in the annals. You can see by the number of pages that it's long and technical. So I won't be able to give details of the proofs, but I think it won't be so difficult to give the statements and the background of where things were at uh, prior to this particular recent progress. So let's remember that a Riemannian manifold, uh, that means there's a smoothly varying inner product G on tangent spaces. And then we can talk about lengths of curves and using infimum of lengths uh, make it into a, an actual metric space, which will be complete. Uh, and if geodesics, for example, are infinitely extendable, which we're going to always assume, although various parts of the discussion are uh, local or even infinitesimal. So the curvature tensor, I remind you, it's a four linear form on the tangent space at each point. It, satis it has certain symmetries always. And if it's not zero, this complicated four linear object, it means that uh, you couldn't possibly find a nice coordinate system in which the metric would look Euclidean at that point up to second order terms, the GIJ that is. Uh, so the Ricci tensor is something which we extract from the curvature tensor. It's a symmetric bilinear form. It's gotten by taking a trace, otherwise known as a contraction. So this is, we sum over some orthonormal basis. So we throw away some information. We get a less complicated object of the same type as the metric, some symmetric bilinear form. So that already 
suggest this should be a good thing to do. And still uh, some geometric information is lost, but some is retained. And that's what we want to go into. And we say a V non-collapsed limit space if conditions one and two of the previous transparency hold. So now let M super N sub H M bar and M underline be the unique up to isometry simply connected manifold of constant curvature H and pick some base point. It doesn't matter which one. And then the only thing we'll know, need to know for a while is that it's a consequence of the lower bound on Ricci that if we consider the volume ratio, volume of a ball in our manifold of radius R divided by the corresponding volume of a ball in our model space H where Ricci is bigger than N minus one H. Then as Gromov observed, this is this monotonicity that we see here, monotone decreasing in the smooth case, the limit as R goes to zero would be one. Uh, the fact that this is decreasing is essentially an ODE result for some time. Uh, namely Bishop originally proved it, it was thought that the so-called cut locus, that is the possibility that geodesics don't minimize forever as they wouldn't on a compact manifold might be a problem. But as Gromov observed, uh, actually it's like a term having the correct sign and it actually makes the inequality stronger if it happens. So you don't have to worry about it. Now a standard, well, a particular case is if we consider, let's say for little r less than capital R, the uh, ball of twice the radius of little r, uh, then the volume of that ball can go up by at most a definite factor depending on n, h, and r. So that's a formal consequence of this one. So in particular, for r less than capital R, we have uh, a doubling condition. Uh, but for the moment, uh, and as a consequence of the doubling condition, we have uh, a standard consequence actually, uh, and just a few lines, a uh, uniform total boundedness, by which I mean that for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, in a ball of radius capital R, there's an epsilon dense set uh, with at most this many members, depending on the, our parameters that we're controlling. Uh, to prove this, you just first consider a maximal epsilon separated set. And then you look at the balls of half the size and apply this in an iteration fashion. So for any one of the points in this set, uh, you can look at the whole manifold as a big ball uh, of radius R centered at that point and applying this repeatedly, or rather five, uh, you see this uniform uh, total boundedness. So uh, now the next thing is the gromov hausdorff distance. And so intuitively, if we have two metric spaces, we're going to assume they're compact because that's the proper context. Then we write this if there exists F mapping this one to this one, no conditions on F, uh, no continuity or anything with the property that in this additive sense, it distorts distances by at most epsilon and the range is epsilon dense. Uh, this condition is not quite symmetric the way I wrote it, but uh, it, it has this, it's possible to make a, a metric, but it's a little more abstract. But this, with this, you have the same topology uh, of convergence associated to this as you would, namely this going to zero, as you would with the slightly more sophisticated intrinsic version of the Hausdorff distance. So it means roughly to the naked eye, unless you have a powerful microscope if epsilon is small, you can't tell the difference between these two. And then the, the previous definition would make sense for non-compact spaces logically, but it's not quite the right notion 
in that context, we're going to want to talk about pointed spaces, so spaces with a base point, and pointed convergence, by which we'll mean uh, the previous notion of convergence on balls of radius r and for every fixed r. So uh, similar to something that you've seen before uh, with uniform convergence on compact subsets. So now Gromov's compactness theorem uh, is, so this is, or one might also say pre-compactness. So if you have any sort of uniform total boundedness, uh, wherever it came from on a class of compact metric spaces, including the previous uh, smooth manifolds with our bounds uh, that we assumed uh, on the Ricci tensor and the uh, concomitant doubling condition. So as a soft diagonal argument uh, shows that any sequence, uh, say satisfying one, uh, and therefore some kind of uniform total boundedness and diameter less than D is pre-compact with respect to this gromov hausdorff distance and the similar statement in the pointed case. So, you know, uh, this is easy to prove and just as with the completion of a metric space, you, you have to show that there's some limiting object which you construct in some uh, abstract argument by some abstract argument, but it's really you use it uh, with equivalent sequences and so on. So this is a soft th theorem, but nonetheless, it provides a kind of framework for uh, going on with the discussion. So in particular, you get elements in the completion, we'll see examples which aren't smooth manifolds in a way that's the whole point, because this is a kind of weak compactness and therefore analogous, these, these guys uh, are analogous to distributions or Sobolev functions, one could think is com completion uh, in a weak topology. And so just as in these cases, if we were interested say in studying PDE, we'd like to know something about these generalized guys, uh, something about their possible structure. And then in uh, just as, you know, say the Sobolev embedding theorem here. Uh, and then having done that, we would expect applications maybe when we strengthen the hypotheses, for example, to the Einstein case, which you could think of as an actual elliptic equation. Uh, just as you know, you have weak solutions to elliptic equations and then regularity theorems to show they're strong. And uh, in that case, maybe you're talking about distribution solutions. So the philosophy is similar. We want to know how much, by how much can the limit space fail to be a manifold. Now I have to say when I first heard about this, it seemed crazy to me that all of a sudden you were off into a world of metric spaces about which you understood nothing, but you know, if you look into the matter and think uh, for a long time, you find that there's uh, something you can say. So let's see some examples. So uh, an easy example, so these are all in two dimensions, these examples, but they're very useful nonetheless to orient your thinking. So one thing you could roll up a sheet of paper very tightly that is consider uh, a circle of small circumference isometric product with R. So that's a flat cylinder. It's intrinsically flat in the sense that the curvature vanishes. And as epsilon gets small, you can't distinguish between this and R itself. But here we're taught, this is an example of collapse with bounded curvature because it stays equal to zero, but the non-collapsing condition that we're focusing on in this talk because we're only controlling Ricci, not sectional, doesn't hold in this case. So Gromov's theorem applies, but this would be a collapsing case where the dimension of would drop in the limit. Now, here's another great example, the surface of an ice cream cone, uh, maybe smooth a little bit where the ice cream meets the cone. So this would have one isolated singular point and be smooth elsewhere. And if you imagine the ice cream cone maybe is made out of wood and sanded it uh, around uh, the, the one sharp point, 
So topologically, the boundary is a sphere, and it's easy to see one way or another that it's the limit of smooth convex two-dimensional compact surfaces, uh, homeomorphic to the sphere or diffeomorphic to the sphere. So this is a perfectly good example. Topologically, it's still a manifold, but not a smooth one. It has one bad isolated point where it's singular in some obvious sense, although it doesn't look so like such a bad singularity because you could imagine a paper cup cone uh, of very large diameter being tangent to the singularity. So the singularity is undeniably there, but it seems to have some good structure, namely conical. Now the same, we could do a similar thing for the boundary of a three simplex. Uh, this is actually, again, although it has creases, the edges, those are only in non-smoothness in the embedding intrinsically. It's like a piece of paper with a crease, you could flatten it out. So it's got four singular points. And again, we could approximate it uh, by something smooth and convex. And then we could generalize that by taking the boundary of this pyramid on, and on each of the four faces, we could erect another pyramid with a uh, small altitude. So now we've got three times the number of faces. And then on each of those, for example, we could erect something with very small altitude and iterate this infinitely many times. And if they go to zero, the altitudes that is fast enough, we get a convex surface with a countable dense set of non-smooth points. Uh, in particular, the singular set in this case uh, has Hausdorff co-dimension two and it's not closed. But of course, we only have one-sided control from below of the Ricci curvature. By the way, control from above is, uh, doesn't put any real constraint. If you have control from below and you add control from above, then things get much more regular and something like this can't happen as we'll, I hope, see at the end of the talk. I hope I'll get there. So, okay, now the most reasonable thing to study if we're interested in what these limit spaces could look like um, is uh, tangent cones. The idea being that in the smooth case, the tangent space is kind of the linearization, right, of the space at each point. And another thing is if you think about the way curvature scales, uh, if I blow it up by making the metric bigger, fixing my attention on some point X, and then using the pointed version of Gromov compactness to pass to a convergent subsequence, and we call that a tangent cone, this tangent cone should have a non-negative Ricci in some generalized sense because by a kind of diagonal argument, because it becomes the limit pointed, Gromov's Hausdorff limit, uh, of things where the lower bound on Ricci is going to zero because that's what happens when we scale the metric and make it bigger. So we expect that to be better already. And if you imagine somehow the tangent cone, uh, if you could say that it was unique, that is independent of the subsequence, then it really, you would expect would have some kind of conical structure. And we'll see that uh, that's true uh, in general. Uh, momentarily, and this comes from the non-collapsing assumption. So let's say that a point is regular and write it this way, if all tangent cones are Rn. So it's at least regular in some infinitesimal sense. We don't know yet that there are any such points, but no one could stop us from making that definition. So it turns out that if in this situation, one tangent cone is Rn, then all the others are also. So that's a non-trivial point. And if we remove it, uh, this uh, regular set, then what's left is called the singular set. And our, in our last example, the singular set was a countable dense set. And, but also in that example, if you think about the construction, you can kind of see from the fact that the altitudes had to be rapidly decreasing that the cone point corresponding to the corresponding pyramid would only be weakly singular. That is the, the pyramid at the top would look very flat, almost 
indistinguishable from RN. So what it is, is if you think of that example, by removing a finite subset for any epsilon, all the points that were left and there, the finite subset isn't dense. So there it would be a manifold that was, was left and that would look infinitesimally uh, very smooth. It wouldn't be quite be smooth, but uh, it would look smooth. And in that example, what would be left when you remove S epsilon would be a manifold. Um, and uh, the main results show that the example is actually typical. Uh, so this, all these two dimensional examples are very illuminating and helpful to keep in mind. Now, here's something that we can say about all tangent cones, Rn or not, in the non-collapse case, namely that they are metric cones. So the next thing will be to understand what that means and why it's true. So um, by metric cone on a metric space Y, which I've written Yn minus one here because we're non-collapsed in N dimensions. So, uh, we might expect this is a legitimate thing to do. It, it means that Y is a metric space and we'll assume that the diameter is most pi. This is true in our situation, actually, uh, as a consequence of the splitting theorem, without which it wouldn't be so obvious that our cross sections would even be uh, connected. If you assume it's connected, but don't impose this condition, the discussion still would make sense. It can't happen in our case, but it makes sense to discuss such cones. But then you would have sort of angular wedges of minimizing rays that would plunge through the cone point. Whereas here, this can only happen as it turns out uh, if it splits off a line. So we'll come back to that later. So in any case, this it, this is something we didn't have to assume to talk about cones, but it's true in our case and it makes the situation much nicer. Uh, so uh, we're talking about now that a metric cone will have a cross section Y, you think of it compact, topologically it's R plus cross Y and the metric looks like this metric in the plane uh, written in polar coordinates and using the law of cosines. So the distance between two points looks like the distance points in the plane. And this is the distance between the points on Y and the bar means the metric on Y. So this would be an angle in the plane between two radial directions. So in particular, Rn is the cone on the unit sphere. And with Colding, we proved in a series of papers uh, that three papers that if X is a non-collapsed limit space, then every tangent cone at a point, and they might not be unique, although mostly they are, is a metric cone. Uh, and this was true in the two-dimensional example we discussed. And where it comes from is the bishop gromov inequality, but specifically the almost equality case. And again, since we're blowing up when we talk about tangent cones, we should think that morally these are objects with Ricci non-negative. So when I talk about Bishop Gromov, which always involves a lower bound on curvature, effectively this lower bound is zero in the case we're interested in. The, the claim is very specific to the non-collapsed case. That is to say, in the collapse case, the conclusion need not hold. Um, because of this monotonicity of this quantity, uh, a lower bound, which is the non-collapsing condition, is particularly useful, as you can imagine. Uh, so as we go out, uh, so, okay, so why is this true that tangent cones are metric cones? So let's think of this. The argument that proved Bishop Gromov actually, that was extracted from a stronger result, a sharper result, which is that you have the same kind of monotonicity of the areas of the boundaries of these balls appropriately defined. 
And so now let's imagine that Ricci is non-negative or it would be okay for this purpose. And suppose we look at a pair of radii and suppose we assume we're in this situation where the monotone quantity, this volume ratio or area ratio uh, of the boundaries is actually constant. So it's monotone, but it's constant. So that's a limiting case. So then by an ODE argument, you can actually show, and this was, I'm, I don't know whether it was a folk theorem or what, that the region in between these two balls, uh, which is an annulus in some sense, it's actually a, a, isometric to an annulus in a metric cone with cross section, just the appropriate version of the appropriately rescaled version of the boundary, right? So you can see this in one direction and it's not so hard to prove in the other direction. This is the equality case, remember, uh, and it's really an ODE argument. You have a string of inequalities and if you were in this case, each of them would have to be an equality and you sort of follow your nose. So the, so this is basically an ODE type result. But with Toby, we proved a version of this theorem, which is quantitative in the sense that the hypotheses almost hold in an appropriate quantitative sense. It's not difficult to see what that'll mean. And it's on the next transparency. And then the conclusion holds in the gromov hausdorff sense. So uh, first you have to, of course, make sense out of this, which you can do in this case in a more or less clear way. And then it's kind of amazing that this is the appropriate sense to say the conclusion almost holds. Things get more dicey if you were talking about the topology. Uh, so the theory has a certain internal coherence in that sense. So uh, let's kind of see why this would be true. Uh, the volume ratio is monotone. And if we examine it, let's say between r equals one and r equals zero, and we call two to the minus i a scale, then because of the monotonicity, it follows that for any notion of almost, uh, the, on almost all scales in a quantitative sense, the volume ratio must be very close to being constant because the non-collapsing condition puts a bound on it in the direction that's missing and would be missing without the V non-collapsing assumption. So that says, since you have this quantity that's monotone and bounded and it travels over infinitely spa many scales, uh, bounded below starts out at one, bounded below by V, let's imagine, then most of the time it's constant, sensibly constant, that is to say, it can only be fail to go down by uh, uh, some delta on a definite number of scales, which is what's being said over here. So if you believe the quantitative version on the previous transparency, that would say that uh, on almost every scale, except for only a definite number of exceptions, uh, the thing is going to look uh, extremely close on its own scale, that's what this is doing here, uh, to an annulus in some metric cone. And, you know, maybe you could change your notion of scale and so on. So the cone could change if we go over a large number of scales and on some exceptional scales, the statement wouldn't be true. But most of the time for a long number of scales, it can change only so slowly that it looks conical in over many scales. And this uh, formally easily implies the statement about tangent cones or metric cones. So the key point is the quantitative version of uh, this rig rigid case that allows you to perturb it. So this is sort of a principle in the whole discussion that Rigid means non-canonical, but if you can make it quantitative and combine it with scaling, then somehow paradoxically, seemingly paradoxically, it goes from non-canonical 
to, uh, to generic on most scales or on appropriate scales. Now, the way that this uh, quantitative version uh, is proved, uh, it's by a kind of uh, specific way of regularizing the situation. And it's a PDE argument. It's not ODE. Uh, it's much, the quantitative version is much subtler than you might expect. It's not just uh, like you make the argument in the equality case quantitative, you have to do something quite different. So here is the idea. If you were on a cone, uh, that is one of these limiting cones, then the, and where it's smooth, the distance function from the vertex, it has a Laplacian, uh, let's say, uh, and you could think of the case of Rn, the Laplacian is a constant and equal to 2n. So we, what we wanna do when we wanna show something as close to a cone is we consider this uh, same equation, uh, and with the boundary values, the same uh, R squared on the boundary of a ball that we want to show is very close to a cone. So now what we know is this volume ratio is almost constant. And the reason we're doing this is that this is the solution of an elliptic equation, right? So we expect it to have better regularity properties. And if we can extract them and show that the boldface guy is close to the actual distance function, which is what we're interested in geometry, then maybe we can transfer in the appropriate situation, you know, like in any regularity, uh, use the higher derivatives to control the derivatives of the function we were really uh, interested in in the beginning. So here are some of the techniques that go into uh, that regularization argument. So um, there's Bachner's formula, which gives control of the Hessian in, uh, in uh, of this regularized function. This uses the lower bound on Ricci. Uh, this can be derived in Rn where Ricci is identically zero just by uh, calculus and uh, mixed partials being equal. Um, so I won't say more about this. Uh, it's something where it's an identity and the term which involves third derivatives in our case is zero. The highest order term drops out because this guy satisfies an equation. So now we get some control over this guy in some sense, and we would like to, first of all, use it to control the actual distance function. And this uses uh, some uh, non-trivial but known uh, tools, Laplacian comparison, which is one way of saying the sharpest thing that was on behind our volume monotonicity and area monotonicity of the corresponding ratios. And then the Cheng Yao gradient estimate, uh, which is away from the boundary of our balls in the interior, the gradient of one of our solutions can be, its norm can be, uh, satisfies a Harnack inequality, if you like, or can be bounded by the function itself. Um, and then quantitative versions of maximum principles. So, Maximum principles are useful for proving the actual rigid versions and quantitative maximum. It's again, you, you use some comparison function so that if a function is almost uh, say super harmonic, but not quite, you can add on a suitable function that you've constructed and make it so. And, or if, uh, it's not only super harmonic, let's say, but by a definite amount, then you can extract more in a quantitative sense than you could from the actual maximum principle. And you use various comparison functions that would sol solve the appropriate equation, but on the model space. And then you study them on your space, use Laplacian comparison. And then there's another point, which is the existence of a good cutoff function. 
So what we mean by that is in comparing this to this, uh, we want to start with integral estimates and in integrate by parts. Um, and we need, it turns out, a good cutoff function to do that and extract information from Bachner's formula. So good means if we were only interested in first derivatives, we could take a monotone function of R and get around the, that, the fact that it might not be smooth on the cut locus. But we want more than that. We want a function that looks like that, but with a bound pointwise on its Laplacian. So the existence of such a function was an important technical point in the story. And uh, this also works. Um, yeah. Um, so now, having done all this and shown that these two functions are close in the appropriate sense, we want to have a way of turning our knowledge of the regularization and using the closeness back into estimates on Gromov-Hausdorff distance to show that our space in these conditions or our ball is close to a ball in a cone. And that's something called the segment inequality. It com comes out of the, uh, the Bishop Gromov type uh, stuff, but suitably manipulated. So here are some uh, of the other results about the structure that were in the work with Toby about non-collapsed limit spaces. So the first point, which uh, is that it's really true that absent the, if it doesn't collapse, then the limit space has Hausdorff dimension n and not lower. And also the Hausdorff measure on the limit space uh, is the limit in the appropriate sense, like volumes of balls converging, for example, you can think of the Riemannian volumes on the approximating sequence. This is a non-trivial point, it looks plausible. The next thing is like in the example we saw, the Hausdorff dimension of the singular set is at most n minus two. So it's co-dimension two, as it was in our example, where it consisted of various, maybe a countable dense set of points was the worst thing that we saw. And then as in our example, if we throw away a big enough piece of the singular uh, set, then what's left um, is uh, actually by Hurlder to a smooth manifold. And as we throw away more and more of the singular set, what we're left with is only the weaker and weaker uh, singular, more and more weakly singular points and by a Riefen type, a Riefenberg, intrinsic Riefenberg type argument, you can show that what's left uh, when you throw away this is an open uh, manifold that looks very much like a smooth manifold in this sense. So now let's say a little bit more about how some of this is proved in particular that the singular set is co-dimension two. So you define a filtration on the singular set, first of all. And the filtration is given as follows, that a point is in SK, if no tangent cone, uh, tangent cones might not be unique at such points, splits off a factor RK plus one isometrically. And then the statement is that the set of such points, which are not splitting off, not, not that regular, not RK plus one regular, uh, has dimension at most k. And then the second point is that actually the singular set is equal to this guy in the filtration. In other words, there's nothing Sn minus one with Sn minus two removed is empty. That's what this is saying. And uh, then you put these together. And to make what I've written here plausible, uh, you could think of a Simplicial complex, for example, the boundary of a tetrahedron and its closed skeleton as corresponding to the sets in this filtration. So at least you have a picture in your head where what I've said appears to be true. Um, so the, this idea had uh, classical precedent, including the definition and the inequality 
in the context of minimal submanifolds uh, due to pioneering work of the Georgie Federer, Fleming, and Almgren. Uh, and the proofs there involved iterated blow-up arguments, which means you go to a tangent cone. Now the situation is improved because if you're not at a vertex, then there's a ray going through your point, stretching out to infinity. And if you blew up at such a point, then that ray would become a line actually, and you could try doing it again. So that's what I mean by an iterated blow-up argument, iterated rescaling, going to the limit, situation improves, do it again, improves more. Eventually, uh, you get contradictions to certain statements. Now, in our situation, it's more highly nonlinear than the classical ones uh, because there's no background metric to compare things to. So the implement case, implementation required new techniques. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we talked about uh, some of them just now. And the classical counterpart of the co-dimension two statement, uh, the most famous is probably Simon's result that minimizing hyperservices have a singular set, which is co-dimension at least seven. So the principle of the argument is the same and we'll explain it on the next slide. Uh, so the idea is if you have good control over what a tangent cone could look like, then in a more special situation, you could say that uh, the cones that are potentially there aren't really there. So that's, let's see how that works in our case. So if we want to show that this is empty in our situation, first we ask ourselves, what could be there? And if you think about it, since we know the cross sections are connected and if it splits off Rn minus one, you see that the only non-trivial possibility, this can't be R or by definition it would be regular, is when it's R plus. But the important thing to understand is that the cone point, that is the vertex of the cone, actually lies on the boundary in this reasoning. Now, this is a perfectly good cone and it's the only non-trivial possibility, but one can see that it doesn't arise as a tangent cone in our situation. Now, why is that? We can at least make it plausible because really, if it did, we would think, uh, we would expect to have this ball, let's say in our cone as the limit of balls and manifolds. But in the manifold, the boundary of a ball uh, is at distance one from the center point. Whereas here, the center point is actually on the boundary. You, you have to understand that that's what the discussion shows. So this guy has uh, an interior boundary, but it's the limit of things where the boundary is at distance one. So something seems to be wrong with that. And by a, a, say a mod two degree argument or otherwise you can make that heuristic argument into a proof. Okay. so. Now we can at least state the new structural results, which are refinements of what was known previously. Uh, but I haven't gotten to what was known previously yet. Um, but we can certainly understand what these are stating. So it says if you look at this epsilon regular, uh, epsilon singular part, if epsilon is small, this is almost all of the singular set. And then just like if it were a smooth code two dimension two uh, submanifold of a compact manifold, if you look at the volume of a tube of radius R, the part that lies in a ball of radius one, then this is bounded by a constant depending on what it has to uh, times R to the power N minus two, just like a co-dimension two, uh, the volume of a, tube around a code dimension two smooth submanifold. The next statement is that the singular set is rectifiable for all K, not just the top one, but all the strata are rectifiable. Now we'll remind ourselves on the next transparency what that means. It means something like it's a submanifold, but only in a measurable sense. And in fact, examples of neighbor and Nan Lee show that rectifiability is the best one can hope for even in an Alexandrov space context.
And finally, uh, every tangent cone at uh, almost all points in the Hausdorff to measure, k-dimensional Hausdorff measure on SK, almost every point has the property that every tangent cone splits off RK. It's not true uh, that it's unique. So this factor here uh, could vary with the tangent cone at the points in question, but for almost all of them in this sense, what splits off is the maximum possible that consistent with the definition of the element of the filtration that it's on. Um, but they might not be unique. But if you think of in the two dimensional case, they must by Bishop Gromov all have the same volume of the cross section. And in the co-dimension two case, that means that the circles have the same circumference. And so the tangent cone is actually unique in that case. Okay, now what do I need mean by rectifiable? A set is rectifiable in our sense or maybe K rectifiable. Uh, so this is a subset of a metric space. If you could divide it up this way as a piece exceptional, which nonetheless has measure zero, and then uh, everything else is a subset by Lipschitz to a subset of positive measure in Rn. So this is only a measurable decomposition, but modulo that it looks like measurable subsets of Rn anyway, not, not necessarily open. So I can't go into, as I said, the proof of the theorems that were just stated, but they had a precursor whose proofs were easier, although nonetheless novel. And a particular point was this volume estimate uh, in slightly weakened form, I say slightly. So in particular, this holds for all the strata. I think I just had Rn minus two in the past transparent, in the last transparency. So notice what's happened. I would like to have N minus K. I can get it if I'm willing to give up any small eta in the exponent, but the price for that is I have to put a coefficient in front of it that depends on eta. And as eta goes to zero, this argument that I'm about to explain, which is less sharp than the one that proves the result without the eta, but much easier to understand, uh, the coefficient blows up uh, according to this argument. In, in fact, it stays bounded, but that's much harder to prove. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, is, is this eta here related to the fact that things were by Holder rather than by Lipschitz in? Well, uh, not, not totally, because uh, the by Lipschitz, I think, is still open, and it's much more subtle than you might expect. Uh, so it's related in some sense, but uh, if you, if, even at this point, uh, I think you, I think it could be true that uh, it's really by Lipschitz, but that's not known yet. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Okay, yeah. Okay, but nonetheless, at least in the Hurlder sense, and we'll see in the application if we get there to the two-sided bound sense, that outside of this tube, there's a definite amount of regularity. So if you imagine for a second, you went back to the previous slide where this isn't there and take K equal two, uh, then the metric is actually smooth, let's say in the Einstein case with definite bound on the Einstein constant uh, in a very precise sense. In other words, you have control over the scale you, go, you have to go to once you're outside of a tube of arbitrary radius uh, on which you can find a harmonic coordinate system in which the metric satisfies definite bounds. That's what I mean here. So really, the strongest application is to the two-sided bound case. And that's basically what I mean, that outside of the tube whose volume you have control of, you have a definite amount of regularity in a quantitative sense. So that's also what I'm saying here. <laughs>
So these techniques were novel. They went beyond what was done in the work with Toby, but they still fall rather far short of what's needed to, let's say, take k equal to and remove the eta. And uh, nonetheless, it's possible. So what I want to do in the remaining 10 minutes, uh, which suddenly became nine, is just mention a little bit about how you can get this result slightly weaker with the eta. And then what's true uh, in the two-sided bound case. So some of the new arguments were a quantitative version of the stratification that we gave, where you control things only down to a definite scale. And on that scale, you assume you're a definite amount of weight, all the intervening scales, you're a definite amount from splitting off the corresponding Euclidean factor, not just that you don't split it off, but on all the scales going far down uh, your definite amount of weight. That's an indication of what's meant by the phrase quantitative stratification. Then quantitative differentiation is just a sort of uh, systematic acknowledgement of what we used to uh, prove uh, that tangent cones were metric cones. There were a definite number of scales only on which it failed to be as true as you want it to be true. And there's something you can extract from that that wasn't done in the work with Toby. And the extraction process involves a quantitative version of cone splitting, and I'll explain cone splitting below. And then there was something called the energy decomposition, which was to get these guys to cooperate with one another. And uh, then there was an iterated recovering argument. So I'll try to briefly give some indication. The new techniques were very flexible and partly jointly with Bob Hasselhofer and Daniele Vitorte, uh, Valtorte, we were able to apply them to various other uh, elliptic and parabolic geometric equations. Also, it had an application to singular and critical sets of linear elliptic PDE, and then other people uh, picked up on the methodology and applied them in other situations. So uh, what's cone splitting? That's an important point. So it was used classically in the context of harmonic maps and it's more geometrical in a sense here. So we said what we meant by a metric cone. So let's suppose we have a metric space Z, which is a cone that is isometric to a cone in say at least two different ways. So what do I mean by different? In each case, if there's an isometry and this has a cone point, then there would be some point say ZI I equals one and two, which corresponds to the cone point. We don't assume at this juncture that the coordinate that the cross sections are the same even. But if the points which it that correspond to the cone points are genuinely different, then it, the base the fundamental point is that the line that goes through them, uh, there will be a line going th through them and it splits off as an isometric factor. Uh, you might think about uh, proving this by using the two kinds of homothetic scaling that would arise from our assumptions to construct this line and the splitting. It's, it's a nice exercise, not totally trivial, but it's a, it's a basic point to be aware of. So if something is a cone in more than one way, after all, if I took a cone and crossed it with a line, I'd get a lot of uh, cone points, a whole line of them, and this is kind of the converse. Uh, so we, with Aaron, proved a quantitative version of this, uh, which you could imagine making up. And it could be iterated in the sense that if you had, say, more points and each pair looked uh, like almost cone points, then you would expect you could split off, almost split off a larger Euclidean factor. So this was a key idea in what we did with Aaron. Now, there's one point to be aware of that comes in as a difficulty. Uh, we know th that 
this is going to look like a cone, if we fix X, then all of these balls only fail on a definite amount of scales to satisfy this almost volume cone equals almost metric cone theorem. So that was part of what we did with Toby, but we didn't extract the full information from it. So with the quantitative cone splitting, the idea is, is the following. So there are all, only a definite number of bad scales for any definition of what we mean by badness, say this one for some small delta, but the particular bad scales uh, depend only uncontrollably on the point X that we're looking at when we move a point a finite distance, since tangent cones are concerned with the infinitesimal behavior at that point, they, they sort of decouple. So in order to get uh, the almost cones to cooperate with one another, what we did in, at that time was introduce what I'll call the energy distribution. Namely, we grouped together down to a very small radius, say between one and two to the minus n, uh, we look at the points with exactly the same good scales and the others are bad, but they're only a definite number. But that what we call good only or bad only depends on something that doesn't depend on the number of scales. It just depends on how it looks like on its own scale. So as N gets large, uh, the possibilities for the actual good and bad scales that grows with n, but only rather slowly because there are only a definite number of them. Uh, so that depends only on delta and it's independent of n. So the possible sequences of good and bad scales for a particular n is not as bad as it would be if every scale could be bad. There are only an, a definite number of bad scales independent of n. So the idea is we want to group the points so that the approximate splittings will cooperate. And uh, then uh, what we find is that although as delta goes to zero, the number blows up, as I was saying, the, the number of patterns can only change slowly because there are only a definite number of bad scales. Now on the good scales, the splitting implies that we're close to something uh, Euclidean and of dimension at most K. And on the bad scales, we can just sort of recover uh, since there are only a definite number of them and that puts a constant in front of the estimate and then we're back to the good scales. So by balancing things appropriately, that's how we can prove the volume estimate with the eta uh, in the exponent, but getting rid of it is another matter entirely. So, uh, this involves the theory of neck regions uh, and this neck decompositions. And this was uh, done in two uh, breakthrough papers by Neighbor and Valtorta, which involved harmonic maps and also uh, minimizing submanifolds. And Neighbor and Zhang, uh, our collaborator in this work, which was on two sided bounds on Ricci curvature. Uh, almost all of that can be recovered by the present uh, work, except something I'll, I'll mention, uh, but uh, the arguments have to be entirely different. So assuming the two-sided bounds, which is closest to what we're doing, there's one estimate that isn't true in our context that makes things much, much harder. And that's why the paper is so long. So, uh, I'll stop there, except I want to uh, mention what's true without much explanation. If you now uh, apply everything we've talked about to the case of two-sided bounds, and let's assume it's Einstein, although the difference uh, with two-sided bound in Ricci and Einstein uh, is very minor. It just increased some increased regularity, but let's assume it's Einstein for the, the moment uh, that this is constant or uh, it's basically the same thing if it's not constant. So first of all, the singular set in that case is closed. And the, so this, the main argument is a fundamental point uh, due to Mike Anderson. Uh, 
and just kind of translated into uh, the technology or uh, that was in uh, the paper with Toby or the papers with Toby, I should say. In that case, uh, this had been conjectured by Mike Anderson that the uh, singular set is actually co-dimension four. So the methodology is the same. It was understood there was only one cone you had to show didn't occur as a limit cone with a two-sided bound on Ricci. It's essentially the product of the paper cup cone in two dimensions with Rn minus two with only a lower bound that can definitely occur. <clears throat> but it was non-trivial to see that with a two-sided bound, it couldn't. And by the way, it was known that uh, and co-dimension four was known from the beginning. Anderson actually was probably the first one to write this in the, the report on his ICM talk in 1993, this conjecture that is the, there are Ricci flat, there's a Ricci flat metric, very explicit, but you don't have to know the formula on the tangent bundle test too. It's called the Aguchi Hansen metric. And if there's one and it's Ricci flat, you can scale it down, which typically you couldn't do uh, in, unless the lower bound was zero. And if you do that, in, if you have one Ricci flat, you have a whole family by scaling. And if you scale it down in the limit, you get R4 minus Z2, that is the zero section uh, gets smaller and smaller. And in the limit, it's just a point. And that's, the, the point has co-dimension four uh, and that shows that you can't do any better than n minus four. Then there was this fantastic result uh, that there's actually an a priori L2 bound on the curvature depending just on the dimension and the volume. So again, we in the earlier work had done this with an eta. And the fact that you can actually get this result is uh, peculiar to the Riemannian situation that is, there's a kind of analogous thing for harmonic maps, but it's not quite true that you get, in that case, it's the gradient being in L3, it's only weak L3. So this is a very uh, borderline result. I find it a great result. And uh, this is the only thing that you can't get in the context uh, with the more admittedly much more difficult arguments. Uh, in the three author paper with Neighbor and Zhang. And then in the paper with, with Neighbor, in dimension four, you can actually prove a finiteness theorem up to diffeomorphism, which is not, uh, doesn't hold in general. And that's the end of what I wanted to say. So. Um, well, let's first of all, thanks, Jeff. <laughs>